Welcome back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. This is Dennis and today I'm with Doug. How are you doing today? I'm awesome. Glad, glad to be back, Dennis. Perfect, perfect. And the the reason I asked an ICU intensivist uh, to come on is because this is actually can be pretty complicated. Um, I would like to walk through, you know, crush syndrome and uh, you know all the ins and outs and misconceptions that, that come up all the time. Uh, so since it's been a hot minute since you've been on, would you mind doing just a real quick introduction to yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name's Doug. I'm a medical intensivist. I currently practice in a cardiovascular intensive care unit at West Virginia University, uh, where we train quite a few 18 deltas in other soft medics. And uh, I'm still in the reserves uh, with one of the special operations commands on Fort Liberty. Perfect. Perfect. So first thing, jumping into crush syndrome, you know, whether it be uh, a natural disaster or a man-made one, um, you know, you're in, you're entering into a pretty, probably a pretty dynamic environment, probably different than most of our scenarios where you have a random heavy weight that falls on a person and there's actually nothing else wrong around the, the uh, scene. So uh, if you wouldn't mind just speaking to scene safety uh, going into the environment. Sure. Yeah. Crush is generally, um, like you say, a dynamic environment, whether it's due to, you know, a blast and a building collapse. Um, could be a construction site, you know, where we're deployed and um, we have medical assets and, you know, there's a construction uh, accident uh, nearby and, and we're invited to help. Uh, and it definitely could be a natural disaster as we just saw in, you know, the big uh, Turkish and Syrian earthquake where I think there were, what, 47,000 casualties. Uh, we weren't participating, but that, you know, that could certainly happen in the neck of the woods where we would have forces that would respond. Um, so, yeah, all of those are, are dynamic Um uh, in a blast injury, you know, you've got to be cognizant of, um, you know, secondary devices uh, that may in, uh, be triggered uh, when the rescuers uh, respond. Uh, construction or um, natural disaster, earthquake, um, also, you know, hurricane with blowdown, you've got unstable structures. Uh, and then you obviously have, um, you know, casualty counts that could range from, you know, the singletons well within your capabilities to manage to a full-blown mass cal where, you know, you really are making some rapid triage decisions and trying to do the most, uh, do the most for the most, not the most, not everything for everyone. Um, so yeah, uh, safety of the rescuers is paramount because you're not going to do anybody any good if you, you take casualties and a lot of rescuers are injured, you know, responding to the scene and, and whatever, um, situation caused the injury itself. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's one statistic everybody kind of throws out is there's one and a half rescuers, uh, that are killed for every person that's been saved, um, which is a pretty depressing, uh, statistic, um, but just, you know, like anything, like we always train, um, you know, scene safety, pay attention to your environment. Don't just charging in and uh, trying to save the day right off the bat. Pay attention to your environment. Yeah. One of the other things to add, too, is, um, you know, what, what's in the air? You know, what's what's been released into the air by uh, the collapsing buildings or the blast itself? Uh, and, you know, be really, really careful or, or keep in mind, in addition to you could be injured by um, a secondary explosion or a further building collapse, you could also, you know, um, become a respiratory casualty pretty easily. So, you know, have the proper uh, have the proper uh, um, ventilation protection as a rescuer uh, and yep. 
and you may have to stand off until you get it. I mean, we saw that in uh, in 9-11, in the, yep. in the Twin Towers collapse. You know, there's a lot of secondary res- respiratory injuries and even deaths of the rescuers years on. Yep, yep, absolutely. And that's just, you know, concrete, dust from the concrete, you know. You know, we're not talking about, you know, exposed electrical, you know, piping, gases, things like that that are opened up and now expose all the rescuers. So just pay attention not only to the environment, but the other rescuers around you. Um, Just got to be super observant. And unfortunately, we now live in an era of dirty chemical munitions, improvised chemical uh, munitions, um, which just adds a layer of nastiness and complexity uh, to a potential uh, conflict uh, explosion. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, barring scene safety and, you know, cribbing and bracing and things like that, that's required because there's going to be a lot of resources that are needed for mm-hmm. some, an event like this. You know, just initial assessment, um, you know, does T-Tri-C still matter or? Yeah, a thousand percent. You know, um, crush uh, casualties, crushed patients are trauma patients. And, um, you know, we're, we're focusing on crush syndrome here and I know we're going to get to that, but let's not skip over the fact that, uh, you know, there well could be other traumatic injuries, um, causing, you know, overt or, um, or hidden bleeding, uh, that could make the patient unstable. So good, TCCC assessment, a, a good primary survey, um, stabilize uh, any other uh, injuries that are life threatening, you know, whether they be bleeding, airway, um, respiratory, um, before you move on um, to uh, free, free the casualty and start, you know, potentially getting into crush syndrome. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, you know, the scenario doesn't care if this is too complex for whatever education level you have, you know, you're given what you're given. It can be a crush and a TBI, a crush and a really fill in the blank. Correct. You still got to deal with it. Correct. You know, I like to say, uh, in fact, I gave a talk earlier this week at WVU on um, cardiogenic shock. And my, my third slide, I think, was a picture of a chef. And one of my favorite sayings is the complex problems are recipes, not ingredients. Um, yep. And so, you know, you really need to pay attention to um, all of the aspects of diagnosis and all of the aspects of management. If you want, you know, the dish that is the successful outcome for your for your um, patient uh, to to be baked successfully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to yeah. take the analogy all the way. Yeah. Um, and, you know, life threats. You know, kind of run into this question, you know, tourniquets, mm-hmm. should I be putting them on early? Should I wait? Um, I mean, he's got like a, you know, 4,000 pound weight on him. I don't imagine my tourniquet's going to cause that much more harm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was um, doing a little bit of reading for this podcast because I was one of the co-authors on uh, initial um, joint trauma system clinical practice guideline uh, for prolonged field care uh, for crush it was one of the first four that we wrote. It was one, one, one of the, the top four that the medics identified as kind of one of the things that keep them up at night. And why don't we tackle that first when we, when we first um, started working with the joint trauma system and, um, you know, did a literature search to see, Hey, you know, what's, what's been published in the last, let's say three years, let's say search from 2020 on, onward. Um, there's a really nice review article that I sent you. I don't know if you mm-hmm. uh, can attach that to the podcast, the link. Um, and you know, our guideline, uh, our clinical practice guideline said, yeah, put a tourniquet on first before you free the casualty because it could, you know, stop the release of all of the toxins down that are built up because you're not getting any circulation. You've got muscle damage, you know, releasing potassium, lactic acid, myoglobin, you know, that is just sitting in the venous system being being trapped from entering the circulation by the crush. And then you, you, um, you, um, remove the object and all that stuff floods back in. We call it a reperfusion injury. We, um, 
we see reperfusion injuries all the time and heart attacks when we open up a blocked artery and in vascular patients, the same thing when we open up a blocked artery minus usually the myoglobin, the muscle, the muscle damage protein. Um, and, um, you know, there's an argument to be made for that. Uh, two of the societies that really do weigh in on, um, on crush, you know, from a disaster, um, response standpoint don't recommend it and their rationale for not recommending it is is the common thing that we see with tourniquets is you put them on and they get forgotten mm -hmm. and that by putting them on before you free the victim um and then you know not expeditiously reassessing whether you actually need it or not you know say within the first hour or two hours they get left on and they cause unnecessary um you know uh, nerve damage um and potentially even limb loss of a limb that was salvageable um so i think this is probably something we should reassess when we look at rewriting the clinical practice guideline which we which we do they are living documents um i uh, I don't know. I think what would my advice be? If you really have no monitoring, right? If you don't have an EKG or telemetry, just a one lead telemetry where you can monitor a heart rate and look at, you know, for PVCs or irregular rhythms. Um, and it's a big crush injury. So both lower extremities, you know, the pelvis, you know, a lot of muscle, uh, you know, the, the gluteal, the gluteal muscles, a lot of muscle that could potentially be, be, be crushed and, and, um, spilling toxic debris, um, that could be released. I would probably argue in favor of yes. Um, but, um, somehow have a protocol to reassess it, whether, to take down that tourniquet as fast as possible. Um, and I would also caveat that by saying you don't have that monitoring resource and you have enough people that you can reassess. If you don't have the monitoring recess and it's a real mass cal and you, and, and you're just going to pull them out and then move on to the next one, I might argue against it because you could be creating a lot of morbidity. Um, you know, the incident incidence of, um, you know, cardiac arrest from crush syndrome isn't trivial. It's I think 20 percent was what one of the figures quoted in the paper. Um, and, and that's probably fatal in a mass cal. Um, but, you know, the the incidence of, of salvageable limbs that need to be amputated is also not trivial. Um, yep. so tough call. I don't think you're wrong either way. Uh, I think yep. probably the best thing is, you know, have a plan going in, have a protocol that you train on and be aware of reassessing the tourniquets as fast as possible. Um, so, I don't think I answered your question. Very that's okay. Well. No, you dodged it successfully. Um, <laughs> what I'm thinking, so I have a guy trapped, you know, in, at least in my mind, if he, for some reason, I'm thinking he is hemodynamically unstable, I cannot see where the source of bleeding is outwardly, I'm going to assume he's bleeding on the other side of this object. I would put a tourniquet on and begin you know, DCR to whatever level I can, give him blood to whatever amount I can um, to resuscitate him. That's, that's going to be something that's a known I, I don't see anything wrong with doing that versus I have a relatively stable patient who does have a giant weight on him. Maybe I don't put the tourniquet on right now. I can wait once because this is not going to be a rapid extraction. This is going to take a hot minute. Um, and just as soon as you lift that off, does not mean that that's when the reperfusion hits him. It can be, it could be minutes later. Um, I've heard upwards of thirty minutes, and you know now suddenly he's got problems. So you're going to need to not only you know have all these people help extract him, get him extracted, at least have somebody on standby to watch for the next thirty minutes, make sure that they continue being stable. Um, and if the, if that stability changes in any way, their mental status changes, 
their pulse feels weird, their chest starts to hurt, their whatever, any kind of negative thing, I would say hurry up and put those tourniquets on, like time now. I don't I, at that point. The, at that point, though, I think the genie might be out of the bottle, right? Okay. So uh, I think by the time you're you're experiencing symptoms of reperfusion injury, you are perfusing, right? Yeah. Um, so that means two things. And number one, it means you probably have some intact perfusion in the leg, right? Your blood vessels aren't completely damaged, and the leg might be salvageable. Um, if at that point, then you know you've determine to the best of your ability that they're not bleeding. Um, and um, this really is crush syndrome with, an, you know, unstable arrhythmias. At that point, I think you're better off treating crush syndrome um, because I think you're too late with a tourniquet. Okay. And another factor that, you know, we haven't talked about too is what's the amount of time for mm -hmm. between the incident and your response, right? Because if it's, if you're Johnny on the spot and you're there within minutes or an hour, um, then instability is probably one of two is probably more likely traumatic bleeding. Mm -hmm. It yeah. could be, you know, um, some early stages of crush syndrome because you've got some perfusion that's getting past the crush or going around the crush, um, the side of the crush. Um, but if it's, you know, six, eight hours later, I mean, it could be straight up dehydration, right? The, yeah. the patient, you know, hot environment, six hours in the sun, you know, uh, panting, sweating because you're in pain, tachycardic because you're in pain, you could well be dealing with just straight up dehydration. You know, the good thing is that the, the treatment for crush syndrome and the treatment for dehydration is the same. You give them, you know, fluids, ideally IV or IO fluids. Um, but it makes it a little harder to figure out whether this is bleeding or not. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, you know, from the outset, the guy is still pinned. Um, obviously, you're getting access of some sort, whether that be IV or IO. Because, like you said, they could be dehydrated. It's going to be a lot more difficult to get IV access uh, when their veins are flat. Uh, so potentially, you need to do just an IO, get fluids started, um, rehydrate them at the minimum, start rehydrating them. Um, and then, you know, if I didn't put the tourniquets on, or maybe even if I did put the tourniquets on, do I go ahead and start hitting them with a bunch of fluids trying to get that urine output up? I think that, you know, lower extremity, lower extremity crush injury, um, you know, one, one lower extremity, both lower extremities, pelvis. Yeah, for sure. You're going to want to start, you're going to want to start hitting them with fluids. I think oral rehydration is fine for this too. If they can drink, they, you know, um, get, give them oral rehydration. Here's where, if you do have, um, you know, portable ultrasound, you know, smartphone-based ultrasound, um, practice putting IVs in with that because uh, in your severely, you know, in your patients who are hypovolemic, um, I had one my last shift in the ICU um, uh, that, you know, we, we couldn't get any any IVs by palpation, but we could get them pretty straight, pretty straight away. Uh, IV guided and um, potentially even an EJ, an external jugular, uh, because, you know, if, if you can get to the head, you know, and they can turn their head, um, uh, if it, you know, ruling out a C-spine injury, uh, that's not a bad idea either. So practice, practice those uh, if they're within your scope of practice. Um, but I'm, I'm a big fan of ultrasound uh, uh, placed IVs. Yeah. I mean, I found that they work really well for more deep uh, veins. I find like the peripheral veins, it's really easy to kind of squish the vein down with just the weight of the probe. Yeah. You know, I'm looking, thinking like a brachial or an antecubital, um, you know, more distal to that, like on the hand, probably not. Um, but uh, it, we get those, we, we have a, a, an ultrasound IV team in the ICU uh, and that, those are the ones they usually go for. Um, okay. uh, antecubital or brachial. And like I said, you know, pretty easy skill to practice. Um, you can do your whole team when you come back from PT, they'll love you for it. Um, right. <laughs> um, but, uh, and they'll be relatively hypovolemic as well. Yeah. Hey, win-win. There you go. Hmm. Good training. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, so how much fluid, how fast? I know an end state, you know, you want that 100 to 200, maybe even 300 cc's an hour. Um, I've heard anyway. And, you know, I mean, am I bolusing this? Am I pressure infusing this? Or do I just let it run? If you have a, um, a if you have a good access IO, you know, and humoral I, IO is probably what you're going to get. Um, I, obviously, you really don't want to. If they're crushed in the lower extremities, you really don't want a tibial IO because all that that's just going to flood into the tissues. Right. You have no idea whether those those vessels are that you're uh, feeding with a tibial IO or even patent or not. But um, if you have a IV or a humoral IO or a sternal IO, um, a liter an hour, uh, probably uh, to start with, uh, if you have the f- supplies, um, the best fluid to have is the best fluid to use is the one you have. Uh, I'm not going to make a recommendation based on that. Um, there are some people who say, oh, you know, don't use ringer's lactate because it's got potassium in it, but it's got a, a trivial amount of potassium and it's yeah. got a trivial amount of, of lactate. Uh, yep. as well. And uh, the lactate, in, anyway, that's a, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. The best fluid to use is the one you have. Um, drinking the same thing, try to get a liter. And it was interesting reading this latest paper that I, I read for the, the podcast. You know, they were saying, hey, if you can get 50 an hour, you're good. Um, yep. So um, yes, maybe with rhabdomyolysis, um, you know, we do want those high urine outputs, but, but just some evidence that the nephrons are working, that the kidney is working 50 an hour, a liter an hour, probably to a max of three to six liters a day, depending on, you know, your casualty, how big they are. Do they have underlying kidney problems? Do they have underlying heart problems? You know, cause yeah. There's a risk with fluid resuscitation and crush, just like there is in burn, of causing abdominal compartment syndrome. And that is a complication that in this, you know, austere sc- scenario would be fatal. You know, yeah. they, w- they would need an, a laparotomy and a, lapar- a dirty laparotomy in the field and a, an earthquake or a, a building collapse or, or a blast is, is going to be fatal. So, you know, go hard early, get the, ear- get the urine going and then back off. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so another a thing, you know, just assuming, I mean, honestly, you can't even assume that people have a, the ability to monitor uh, the heart with an EKG, you know, even, you know, even the one leads, you know, which are relatively cheap and easy to, to pack. Um, you know, how do I recognize uh, for certain that you know, this patient is getting an influx of that potassium. I know the classic is like a peak T wave, but I've also read that that doesn't always happen. Well, there, there are two things that are going on with the heart in crush syndrome. One is the effect of potassium, which, you know, on an EKG will cause a peak T wave. It'll also cause PVCs, premature ventricular complexes. So if you can get a pulse and it starts to, and it feels really irregular, um, you know, it's thready and then you feel a big beat and then it's thready again. You feel a big beat. Those are PVCs probably until proven otherwise on a monitor. Um, I would be concerned about that. Um, and then, but, uh, and then, like I said, peak T waves, and then, you know, you're going to, you're going to deteriorate into a ventricular arrhythmia. V- VTAC or VFib, uh, which will probably be, pul- you'll probably just lose a pulse. Um, yeah. to be quite honest. Uh, and at that point you're doing CPR and, you know, kind of following that H's and T's algorithm and ACLS, you know, everybody hates that on final exam right. day, but it's there for a reason, you know, hyperkalemia. Um, and then, and then, you know, you're hitting them with your calcium insulin and dextrose. If you have it, albuterol, if you have it, um, you know, um, I think teams that respond to disasters probably have pre-packaged kits for crush Mm -hmm. with monitors, with uh, at least simple one lead monitors, with calcium, with nebulizers, et cetera. You know, uh, military units may not. 
Um, yeah. but, but those are some of the considerations and on honestly, just a lot of fluid will help ameliorate. If you have nothing else, calcium and a lot of fluid is going to help. Now, the second thing that's going on is lactic acid because lactic acid is building up, um, downstream of that. And lactic acid has its own effects on the heart causing, you know, um, uh, problems, both the conducting system and the heart doesn't like an acidic environment and the, the contractility of the heart doesn't like a acidic environment and the, and the contractility of the blood vessels that maintain your blood pressure doesn't like an acidic environment. So you're going to have just from acidosis, a vasodilatory shock, decreased cardiac output, cardiogenic shock, and potentially unstable arrhythmias. Um, and that's where um, sodium bicarbonate can be your friend. Um, and, and again, that's something we didn't recommend in the CPG because I think we were looking at it more from a potassium myoglobin standpoint and not so much from a lactic acid standpoint. But I think when we look at it again, we should train our lens a little bit more on the lactic acidosis component of crush syndrome. And um, I like the recommendation in the e emergency medicine paper, you know, that talked about um, uh, if you're concerned for lactic acidosis, un unstable patient, you're concerned for, for acidosis, you know, um, put 150 um, milliliter, is it millig milliliters, milligrams of um, sodium bicarbonate in a liter of saline. And, uh, and, and, and use that as your resuscitation fluid instead of straight crystalloid. Okay. I want to say usually it's in milli equivalents. Is that correct? That's, that could be right. Okay. I'm not looking at the uh, paper and, and that's okay. Every once in a while I mess up my units, but I always check before I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So essentially three amps of sodium bicarbonate, yeah, three 50, amps. it's 50 mil equivalents per amp and yep. you three of those. Uh, and I've been, I've been doing some training in the field with some of, some of the military units and, you know, uh, um, I'm encouraging them to pack at least six amps in their loadout because you can use it in crush. Um, you can improvise hypertonic saline with it for TBI. Yep. Um, and, and you can treat acidosis with it. Um, that's, that's, you know, severe acidosis. It's caught depressing cardiac output and, um, and vascular tone. So, yep. And it's shelf um, stable. Shelf stable yeah. and it's portable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if we can just finish up with the calcium part of it, and I definitely want to jump back into the, the sodium bicarbonate. Um, so the recommendation: ten mLs of calcium glutamate or calcium chloride. Those two things are not created equal. So is it ten mLs of gluconate and like three cc's of chloride, or Give it what you have. Honestly, we just give a gram of calcium, and it, it doesn't really matter which one it is. I know they're not e e equipotent. I think, um, again, the best calcium to use is the one you have. Okay. And what kind of end state am I looking for? Is it just kind of resumption of a normal rhythm? Um, may I have to give more if it's like a it's a really bad crush? Um, kind of what are my triggers? Yeah, you may have to give more. The one caveat to, to giving calcium is it's got to be a slow, if you're going to put it in a syringe and push it, you need to do it slowly. Because if you slam it in, um, it, it you know, if you just push the plunger, I don't know if people can see my finger. If you push the plunger yeah. like that, you can actually trigger arrhythmias. So, okay. you know, I like a nice, slow, like a CC, count to five, another CC, count to five, another CC, count to five, even in code situations in the hospital or unstable patients where, you know, we, and we give calcium like water in the, in the cardiovascular intensive care unit, because the heart muscle loves calcium for contractility. And, and you can, you can really back yourself down off some vasopressor doses just by giving uh, people calcium you can watch their blood pressure go from 60 systolic to 130 systolic in in you know one push um yeah. you do have to repeat it you would have to be prepared to repeat it your indication to repeat it is they become unstable again you know okay. it worked then they become unstable then you do then you push it again uh -huh. okay is there any time period 
I, I mean, I know the body does not uh, respond like, oh, I've received 10 cc's, so now I'm going to respond like this. Um, it's hard to tell. You know, it, yeah. at some point you will have enough calcium in, in your body, usually within one usually within one or two grams I, I rarely push the third um you know maybe three i don't think i've ever pushed more than three in a in an unstable patient now mind yeah. you our our patients are not crush patients so i i can't yeah. speak to that um but you know there are risks to being hypercalcemic as well um yes. so you know you want to give enough to stabilize the myocytes in the heart I'm going to give enough to stabilize the contractility of the heart and the blood vessels and then probably stop. Then if they're hypotensive, you got to be thinking, well, you know, are they in shock from hypovolemia? Are they in, are they becoming septic? Are they in shock from blood loss? You know, what else could be going on? Yeah. I'd say beyond a couple of grams, you probably need to be thinking what else could be going on. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, jumping back to that, the sodium bicarb, so I remember way back when we talked about sodium bicarb and how it doesn't really push the needle one direction, alkalotic, that much. Um, so is this something that I'm just going to have to continue giving to maintain that? Yeah. You know, what clears? Bicarb is interesting. There's a lot, you know, you'll never, I don't think you'll ever find a paper that will say outcomes are improved with sodium bicarb. And you'll find yeah. a lot of people who will say, you know, don't give it based on the literature. Don't give it based on the fact that it breaks down to, you know, water and carbon dioxide. So you trade a, me a metabolic acidosis for respiratory acidosis. I'm just here to tell you from personal experience. And a lot of my cardiovascular intensive care friends are here to tell you from personal experience that in a jam, when the pH is 6.9, 7, 7.1, and the patient's blood pressure is in the tank and they're maxing dosing of one and two and three vasopressors that it can turn things around. And yeah. you're not, you know, you're not, you're really, you're not trying to affect their, you're not using sodium bicarb as, as a, to cure them, right? You're using sodium bicarb to buy time for the things that will stabilize them to work. Um, yeah. And that's it. You know, and yeah. if, and if they don't respond to it, you know, if you get their pH to seven point three and they're still sick as heck and unstable, okay, you know, maybe they're now either in irreversible shock or they have a shock mechanism that you haven't diagnosed that you need to look for. But you know, if you get them from seven zero to seven three, the pressors will finally work because you know one yeah. little known, one lesser known fact is that all your catecholamine vasopressors phenylephrine, neo, norepinephrine, levo, levofed, epinephrine, epi, no, all of them are relatively ineffective at a pH below 7.1. Yeah. And so if you just increase the pH and let the pressors work, then you can, you know, use more guideline driven therapies that are associated with good outcomes. So that's my, that's my take on it. I've definitely changed my practice a lot since I've worked with unstable hearts. Um, and, you know, I definitely, and, you know, and would welcome comment, you know, from other people on or, and criticism, but that's, that's Doug Powell's take on sodium bicarb. No, oh, perfect. Perfect. And I've, I've always just found, you know, the body wants to do something like in this case, the body wants to get rid of the potassium. If you can facilitate the body getting rid of potassium, in this case, the fluids, and then you can stabilize the body long enough that it can do the thing it wants to do. Outcomes are probably going to be better than me diving in with my one year of medical education, um, just making things normal. Right. Like I said, you know, it's it, 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 back at the beginning, we said complex problems are recipes, not ingredients. And, you know, and, you know, if, if a patient is really bad and getting worse, you probably have minutes to no more than an hour to arrest that slide or they become, you know, irreversibly shocky and they're going to die. So, you know, in, in 
throw something at them and see if they respond. See if you can walk them back off that line from decompensated and to irreversible shock and get them back more in that decompensated headache toward compensated territory where your other therapies will take over. Um, and then, and then you're done, you know, I'm not giving bicarb, you know, to stable patients. I'm, right. I'm doing it to patients where, you know, I'm just about out of Schlitz. Um, yeah. or, you know, our team is just about out of Schlitz. Let's, let's see. And, and some, and some, not everybody will respond, but some people do, you know, and, and then the, then the situation is dynamic, right? Then you have a different patient. You have a, you know, not an unstable, getting worse patient. You have a, you have a sick stabilizing patient who's getting better. Um, and that's, and, and then you can go from there and then and right. you're probably going to have to do different things. Right. Absolutely. Um, obviously, you know, I think after we have dealt with this crush syndrome, like one, it's going to be out, it's going to be a hot minute before you're actually done dealing with crush syndrome, I think, uh, depending on the potassium load. And you're not going to know that until you start drawing labs to try and figure that out. Um, so we're just essentially stabilizing things until we can get them to someone far smarter. I'm going to give them to you, Doug. Um, but, uh, you know, after, you know, once we've gotten on this train and we're, we've got a stabilized patient, I, I believe essentially we're dealing with essentially just wound management after that. So, you know, your antibiotics, you know, irrigation, you know, not nothing crazy because we have a potentially unstable person. So surface things, um, to not rock the boat too hard. Yeah, antibiotics are, are key. You know, if you've got open wounds, you're in a dirty environment, um, you've got all, all sorts of things, you know, grandma urtapenum, and then you can forget about it for 24 hours. Um, yeah. um, and, you know, reperfusion injury, yeah, it, it's generally a phenomenon of hours to, you know, I would say no more than a shift, uh, you know, to put it in hospital terms, uh, 12 hours, you know, we see... Um, Big heart attacks, you know, where like the left, you know, left anterior descending proximal occlusion of the left anterior descending artery gets opened up. They come, you know, when because they had a, a STEMI, a complete occlusion, they will come to the ICU afterwards because we want to monitor them for reperfusion injury for at least a shift. Um, and if it happens, it does, you're right, it doesn't happen immediately. It can happen hours later. Um, and then, you know, probably the storm's going to go on for four to six hours or so. And then by the time morning comes, everybody would be like, why were you so excited last night? And it's like, that patient right. looks great now. Right. Um, so just, uh, if you wouldn't mind, I, I would like to just kind of run through what I had planned before and see how, how far off I was. So, you know, have a crushed patient, you know, you do your T-Tri-C you know, life threats, he doesn't have any, I am actually just dealing with the crush. Um, you know, if they're hemodynamically unstable, I planned on putting on, you know, tourniquets on the lower extremities because every crush syndrome is always the lower extremities in every scenario I've ever had. Um, and now, um, once we're, once we're at least ready to move, I had planned on just tightening up, tightening them down preemptively because I am assuming that he's probably going to bleed once the pressure gets on. Um, we extract the patient. It's still crush syndrome. I am just have a mobile crush syndrome that I can now take to where I have more resources uh, to bring to bear. We get them to this place. We start with monitoring. Um, I would have already had IV access already because of at least pain control, uh, potentially antibiotics. Some, you know, I need access, probably multiple points of access. Get some kind of monitoring on. Now, let's start dealing with these tourniquets. Can we remove them? Can we, you know, I know that there's probably going to be some kind of reperfusion injury, but I don't want to have to deal with it in an emergency. I'd rather deal with it when I'm more prepared. I have more resources, et cetera. Um, I have my fluids going. I have my urine output higher, um, like we said, maybe 30 to 50, potentially upwards 100 to 200. We start reducing these tourniquets. I think ideally would be at one at a time. 
and I'm monitoring this patient, looking for essentially anything outside of normal. If there is something outside of normal, that's when I'm starting to give my calcium slow push, you know, have it, have it already pre-drawn 10 cc's, start pushing slowly, watching that EKG, watching my patient, watching their hemodynamics, seeing how, making sure that things don't go completely out of whack. And I'll keep giving that until I have a stable sine wave, or not sine wave, a stable, stable you know, um, sinus rhythm. Okay, fluids are going, um, yeah, essentially, I don't know what to do after that. I don't know if, if I don't have an, assuming I don't have an iStat to tell me my potassium is too high, assuming I can achieve a, a normal sinus rhythm with my calcium, I don't know, do I need to still give albuterol and uh, raid the pharmacy for insulin and D50? Yeah, so a couple things with that. Um, if you put that tourniquet on, I still think you need to be getting them to that place where you can stabilize them and monitoring them and reducing those tourniquets within a couple of hours max. Yes. And if yes. you can't, I th I, if you can't, I think you and your team need to have a discussion going in about, you know, are, do we, do we want to do tourniquets first for these big lower extremity unstable patients? Um, and, and run the risk of, you know, unnecessary amputations um, at the expense, at, at, at the benefit of, you know, minimizing cardiac arrest uh, or not. I, I can't give you an answer one way or the other. I think, you you know, there's literature and there's, there's guidelines that favor both. Uh, yes. Your team just needs to have a plan. And ideally the yes. plan gets them to some place where they can be monitored and you can reduce them quickly and you can sort of have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. Um, the second thing is that once you get them to that stable place and you start to take down the tourniquets, if they become unstable, that's when I would switch my IV, my fluids to, to a bicarb solution because okay. you don't know if they're unstable because of potassium or because of lactate. Um, okay. And, um, you know, the, the bicarb is going to help with your lactate uh, and it won't oh, hurt with, and it won't hurt with your potassium. Yep. And of course I'm going to expect and title if I'm monitoring that to climb that's normal, it eventually will come back down on its own. Yeah, if they have spontaneous respirations and you create a, a respiratory acidosis, they're going to breathe that off too. So again, I don't, I'm not sure what all the fuss is about, but um, right. like I say, it's, yeah. if they're on ventilators, we up their respiratory rate. You know, we check a blood gas and we up their respiratory rate. If they're in the field, you put an end tidal line and if it's climbing, you know, they're, they're probably going to breathe it off spontaneously if they're breathing. And if they're not breathing spontaneously, you're probably criking or intubating them. And then you just up your respiratory rate. Right. Yeah. It's, that's a natural thing. Just expect to ha that it will happen. So you don't freak out and start doing other things that you shouldn't be. And honestly, with three amps of sodium bicarb, it's not going to happen. If you get to like six, nine, 12, okay, that's when you really start seeing it. But um, okay. but your first three amps, I think those are kind of almost a gimme. Okay, perfect. So we start seeing any kind of changes. I would assume just essentially just assume once you start releasing those tourniquets, everything that you see as a change has to do with you just removing those two tourniquets. Right. We start the sodium bicarb drip. Uh, I mean, do you just open it up and let it run, or do you just drip that in over? Open it up, let it run. Small bumps of my calcium, trying to get things back to a more stable state. And then now you have control. Yeah. Now you have Pos acute control in a very resource limited setting, and hopefully you're going to get less resource limited as you hand that patient for, you know, this is obviously going to be somebody who gets um, triage to urgent. Um, and so hopefully urgent gets them, you know, to a higher level of care sooner rather than later. Right. Um, Cause like, like you mentioned, you know, I have what I, I have what essentially I have. Like there's, there's no run into the pharmacy. Um, and you should be able to plan that out. Like, Hey, I have, 
six amps of sodium bicarbonate in my crush kit. I have, you know, you know three to six uh, grams of calcium in my crush kit. If this calcium is only lasting me, you know, 10 to 20 minutes um, because of the patient's condition, you can kind of plan this, start planning this out. I can only hold on to this guy for so long. Yeah, and you can only hold on to this guy, yes. not these guys or these people. Right. Um, so that's a you know single a single entrapment, and hopefully everybody else doesn't have you know major um, crush injuries. You did yes. make a good point earlier. You know, you you kind of it kind of rolled off your tongue where you said, you know, all the scenarios I've had are lower extremity crush, but it is really important. You know, the the muscle the muscle mass necessary to generate crush syndrome really is in the pelvis, the gluteus, in the in the in the major muscles of the upper legs. Um, you know, it's it's rare bordering on vanishing that, you know, an upper extremity entrapment is going to buy you significant crush syndrome, reperfusion injury. Okay. So essentially we're just dealing with almost a blast injury. We're yes. more worried about perfusion of the limb Correct. and wound management. Wound management, exsanguination, fractures, yeah. open, open wounds, antibiotics, you know, you know the deal. Perfect. Perfect. Um, and we haven't was, even muddied the water with, you know, burns if this is an explosion. Yes. So let's not go there. <laughs> yes. Oh, I would like to deal. Ideally, I have one casualty. Let me focus on this one guy. I think you're dealing with mass casualty, super mass casualty. Like in my in my world with what I have carried, like we are in a completely different ballpark and we're going to triage hard. So, um, with that in mind, like I'm focusing all my energies on this one patient, walking him through this crush syndrome. Is there anything else that I've missed that are is you know it really is important to this? Like, when do I decide to do the albuterol or the insulin and D50 or any other technique? Well. You know, if they're continuing to have cardiac instability and, um, you know, again, you're not sure if it's potassium or lactate, um, you know, you sort of treat for both. You know, you're giving them the bicarb, you've given them calcium, which is, you know, part of the algorithm for uh, cardiac instability due, due to high potassium. Um, but then, you know, you do the insulin and D50 uh, or insulin and dextrose. It's usually 10 units of insulin and an, an amp of D50 is what we do. Okay. Um, but, you know, you but would I would I just give those things or, hey, if you're, you know, you're pushing calcium and you're not seeing great effects. If, if they're know, unstable, or, if they're unstable, you bet you bet you're giving them. OK, you know, OK. Because there's, you know, so risk versus benefit, right? So, yes. you know, if you give insulin and you don't give dextrose, okay, there's a big risk. You know, you could crash yep. their blood sugar and they could arrest from that. But, yes. you know, if you give them, you know, insulin that drives their blood glucose down, you know, 100 points, and then you give them, you know, 100 points worth of dextrose, um, then, you know, net neutral, you know, you yes. haven't done anything. But what right. you have done is, is the insulin is moving... Um, that potassium into the cells if, if it's indeed there at least temporarily you know and it's you know an hour a couple hours um okay you know and uh if they have competent kidneys their kidneys are going to help you out um yes. you know removing the calcium you just need to get it low enough that they don't arrest um right. while the rest of the body catches up to help metabolize it this that's the okay. same principle with uh, albuterol albuterol is tougher i think in a I mean, insulin is not yeah. easy because it needs to be refrigerated. Um, right. Albuterol is not easy because you need, it needs to be nebulized, you know, yes. a couple of, and now you can make, uh, you can MacGyver a nebulizer. Yep. Um, well, only if you have an airway. Sorry. Yes. You have, you have to have a crike. Well, I mean, if you, if you don't have an airway, we don't have to worry about crush. Um. But if, if, if they have an airway, an endotracheal tube or a crike, uh, you can MacGyver a um, nebulizer by putting a meter dose inhaler in a 60cc syringe, 
take the take the plunger out of the syringe. Mm-hmm. You get the syringe, you pull the plunger out, you put the um um you put the meter dose inhaler in yep. with with a tip down toward the tip of the syringe. Yes. You put the plunger on top, you stick that in the end of the airway and you mash down on the on the plunger and it aerosolizes that down the airway and it acts as a, 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 a makeshift nebulizer. Yep. Yep. No, I've definitely done that. Um, keep in mind, you're going to have to keep puffing uh, with that. Um, and just keep in mind also the, the, the crike, the tube, the plastic is going to absorb some of that. So you're going to have to probably go a little bit farther as far as numbers of pumps. Uh, well, just yeah, make sure you wanna, you're getting that. You want to hit it as hard as you can to give it as much force to get past the plastic. Um, okay. But it's still, um, you know, it still beats, you know, doing a meter dose inhaler and most of it's going in the back of your mouth. Right. You know, like a nebulizer. Cause, yes. and, and, you know, trying to get a crush victim to actually inhale a, a, neb, a, a albuterol neb while they're in pain and not to, you yes. know, breathing shallow cause they've got broken ribs is, you know, you're basically wasting it. It's just going out in the back of their mouth. Yeah. So if you, if there are, if they're not, if they don't have a definitive airway, you really need a nebulizer or you're just wasting your time. Yeah. Uh, if they do have a definitive airway, you can do pretty darn well with the 60 CC syringe um, improvised technique. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Um, is there anything else that I'm, I've been missing out of my plan? No, I don't think so. I think you're good. <laughs> I think you're perfect. Good. You, we saved the one guy. <laughs> I saved the one <laughs> or the one where we see, we saved the one woman, man, women, child, man. But, right? uh, yeah, Mascal, it's, it's, an, it's a whole yeah. other story. That's a completely different story. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Doug. I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, you're welcome, Dennis. Always great spending time with you and uh, happy to come back anytime. Perfect. Perfect. I definitely will. All right. Take care, everybody. All right. For today's podcast, be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Our boy is waiting there for you.